Hello, everybody. My name is Parampreet, and uh, today I'm going to discuss with you about how the answers to the questions which have come in this year main examination for GS paper one should be written down and what should be the approach we should follow to write our answers in the word limit that is mentioned in the question. <clears throat> so let us begin with that. These are the questions which have come in the GS paper one this year from history. There are three questions which have come from the culture portion <clears throat> and two questions have come from the portion of modern history that relates to the British conquest of India and the Indian national movement. And one question has come from the post independence consolidation and reorganization. One thing which I would like to tell to all of you that these questions which have been given this year in the examination can be answered with very little understanding about the approach in which the answers to the questions in UPSC is needed. Most of the time, the students inside the examination hall get worried after seeing the question only because they would have never thought about that kind of question from the topics which they are studying. I would like to tell you that these questions which have come in this year examination could easily have been written with little bit of common sense, which can be applied by any student if he has studied basic books of the history. The first question is, how would you explain that medieval Indian temple architecture represents the social life of those days? Now, whenever we study the medieval history, one portion of the medieval history is about the development of art, architecture, literature during the medieval ages under different dynasties. Now here they are asking about the temple architecture of that pre period and how does it reflect the social life. Now the word sculpture which is mentioned in the question simply means an art of making any kind of statue or an idol by carving of the wood or stone, by modeling a clay or by casting in the melted metal. The sculptures which are found inside the temple, one thing which they always indicate is about the religious belief of the people at that time. Here are the names of some of the important towns of the medieval ages from where we find the temples built during those times. It is Mahabali Puram, Kanchi Puram, Kanzabur and Hampi. And the temples which are found in these places, inside the temple, we find various kinds of statues, which are made of metal, sometime of clay, sometime of wood and stone. Now, what does these sculptures tell to us? First and foremost, these sculptures tell us about the religious belief of that time, that is the gods and goddesses which were worshipped by the people in that period. Then while writing this, it is good if you give some examples to the things which you have written in your answer. So in the example, one example which we can quote is about the Vijayanagar temples. Vijayanagar dynasty belonged to the medieval ages and under the rulers of the Vijayanagar, many temples were constructed, especially in their capital, Hampi. There are two good examples which you can give. One is Hazar Rama temple and the another one is Sri Vijaya Vithal temple. These are the two examples which can be given. In fact, Hazar Rama temple is known by the name Hazar Rama because on the walls of the temple we find the images of Lord Rama and other gods especially those who are associated with the story of Ramayana. So in that way, from the temple sculpture, we come to know about the religious belief of the people at that time. From the temple sculpture, we also come to know about the gods and goddesses which were popularly worshipped by the people at that time. Apart from this, these temple sculptures also tell us about the form of art 
which was popular among the people during those days. Like for example, in Sri Vijaya Vithal Temple, this temple is famous for its musical pillars. These musical pillars are also known as Sare Gama pillars. And this kind of architecture in the temple indicate towards the fact that music as a form of art would have been very popular at that time. Apart from the music, from the temple sculpture, we also get some information about dance as a form of art practiced by the people during those days. Because in many of the sculptures, we find there are images which are in the dancing pose of different types. So one thing which we come to know through the temple architecture is the religious belief. Another thing which we come to know from the temple architecture is the arts which were popular among the people during those days. Then apart from that, from the temple sculpture, we also get to know about the imaginative skills and the creativity of the artisans during those days. And here we can give example of <clears throat> the Pallava and the Chola temples of that time. Because what we find is that in the Pallava temple, regarding the sculptures or the images which have been found in this temple, one popular image is of Yali. And in the Chola temple, we find the image of Yazi. Yali and Yaji are kind of composite creatures. That is, those creatures in which we find body of one animal and the head of another animal. Like for example, in case of Yali, we find that the body is of lion, partly of elephant and partly of the horse. Similarly, in the case of Yazi, we find that it is a mythical animal which combines the feature of both the lion as well as an elephant. So in that way, from here, we come to know about the imaginative skill and the creativity of the artisans. Apart from that, these sculptures also give us knowledge of the human anatomy. And here you can give the example of the bronze sculpture of Nataraj. Nataraj is a dancing form of Shiva. And when we see the bronze sculptures of Nataraja, which was found especially under the Chola period or during the Chola period, the kind of uh, anatomical clarity which can be taken or which can be seen in those images clearly indicate towards the fact that the artisans of that time had a very good knowledge about the human anatomy. And another thing which again these sculptures tell us is about the esoteric beliefs of the people. And in that context we can give the example of the erotic sculptures which are found on the temples of Khajuraho. The Chandela rulers had built this temple, which can be seen today in the present day state of Madhya Pradesh. So there we find are the temples. On the walls of the temple, there are certain erotic sculptures. And these kind of erotic sculptures indicate the belief of the people of that time towards Tantrism. It is also said by certain scholars that this kind of sculpture on the outer walls of the temple indicate some belief towards sex education. Okay, so in that way, these beliefs of the people can be known through the temple sculpture. And then finally, the temple sculptures also give us information about the flora and fauna with which the people of that time would have been familiar. Like for example, in the temple sculpture, we find the images of gods and goddesses. And in many cases, we find that in Hindu gods and goddesses, these gods and goddesses have their own vehicle, which is called Vahan. Like in the case of goddess Durga, the Vahan of Durga is lion. In the case of Lord Shiva, he is always accompanied by a bull called Nandi. So in that way, 
by seeing the images of different gods and goddesses we could also find the picture or the images of the animals associated with those gods and goddesses and in the form of a sculpture when it is present it gives us information about the flora and fauna with which the people are very familiar then again in many cases we find that hindu goddesses are also accompanied with certain kind of flowers in their hand like one very popular flower which we find in the context of the hindu goddess is lotus so lotus flower with the images of hindu gods and goddesses the sculpture in the form of several animals with the hindu gods and goddesses give us information about the flora and the fauna of that time so in this way by writing about different informations which come from the sculptures and giving example on to it you can easily complete these uh, this answer in 150 word and the answer would be very good because you have already we have provided all the information that was needed in the question here you can see in the slide like this is one of the pictures of the uh, of one very um, uh, important medieval architecture of the india and here you can see the images of those animals as it is found inside the campus okay and then again this is the image of natraj so this is what i was informing you that with these images in the form of sculptures inside the temple and sometime out, out on the outer walls of the temple we come to know about the social life of that time and the religious belief of the people of that time okay so that is one now the next question which has again come from the culture portion of your syllabus is this discuss the main contribution of the gupta period and the chola period to indian heritage and culture now here we know that the gupta age is known as the golden age of india the time period of the gupta age is from the 4th century ad to the 6th century ad so gupta age is known as the golden age of india and why it is known as the golden age of india one major reason for that is that during the gupta period we find there was much better development in india in the field of art architecture literature and science and technology so no doubt gupta period contribute to the indian heritage and to the indian culture in different forms similarly in south india there is a period called chola period the time period of the cholas is in the early medieval ages 8th century ad to the 12th century ad and according to many scholars the chola period of south india is the golden age of the history of the peninsular india so just like the gupta age is considered as the golden age of india the chola period is considered as the golden age of the history of the peninsular india and here again when we write these thing we have to put some examples we have to put certain arguments on the basis of which we would be able to establish this statement that yes there was great contributions of these periods in indian heritage and culture and how can we put those example we all know that the beginning of the nagara style of the temple architecture is from the gupta period there are two main forms of the temple architecture one which is associated with the north that is nagara style and one which is associated with the south that is dravida style so the beginning of the nagara style of the temple architecture was during the gupta period here you can give one example there is one gupta period temple at a place called bhitargaon in modern day uttar pradesh here is the picture of that temple this is one of the earliest nagara style of the temple in india and then in the gupta period we find there was much development in the language sanskrit sanskrit has been a very ancient language in india but it is said that it reached to its classical stage during the time of the guptas sanskrit is also said to be the court language of the guptas and many texts have been compiled during the gupta period both religious as well as secular in this language and here you can give some example of the text compiled or composed by the great poet of that time kalidas i hope you all would have heard this name and kalidas is also is also called as 
द शेक्सपियर ऑफ इंडिया एंड वाई इज ई कॉल एट द शेक्सपियर ऑफ इंडिया बिकॉज ड्यूरिंग द टाइम ऑफ कालीदास वी फाइंड दैट सम वेरी पॉपुलर वर्क ऑफ दैट टाइम वर कंपोज एंड नॉट ओनली द वर्क वर कंपोज एट दैट टाइम इवन लेटर इवन लेटर वेन द ब्रिटिश रूल्ड इंडिया मेनी ऑफ हिज वर्क वर ट्रांसलेटेड इन टू इंग्लिश बिकॉज ब्रिटिश फेल्स दैट द यूरोपियन शुड बी मेड फेमिलियर with the way of life of the indian and one of the best way was to translate these books into english so one example you can give of kalidas another example you can give here is of aryabhat he was another great scholar of that time unlike kalidas who was a poet aryabhat can be considered as a mathematician so he wrote a text which is known as aryabhatiya and in that text of aryabhat we find much of the information which is very uh, very much related with the present day mathematics and other branches of science especially astronomy so that way you can say that during the gupta period there was much rich development in the field of literature there was much rich development in the field of language there was much rich development in the field of temple architecture and that is what is the contribution of the gupta as to the indian heritage and culture then we come to the chola period now the chola period is that period of the history of south india where the temple architecture of the dravidian style reaches to its climax this temple architecture begins under the pallavas and then it reaches to its climax under the cholas give one example which is a very good example that is brihadeshwara temple or raj rajeshwara temple it is in present day tamil nadu and this temple is famous for its vimana or the tower which is made upon the garb griha of the temple that is the tallest tower of any temple in the world and it is also one of the unesco's world heritage site this temple brihadeshwara temple then chola period is also famous for the bronze sculpture of lord shiva in the form of nataraja just now in the previous question i mentioned about this to you you can also write about that in this answer and one very important thing about the chola period is that cholas as the rulers in india have formed an empire which is not a land empire but is a maritime empire cholas are one of the rulers of india who have created that kind of a maritime empire many parts of the present day south and southeast asia were under the control of the cholas and in this context the presence of the chola kings in india resulted into expansion of the hindu cultural influence outside india because wherever the cholas have ruled in the countries of south and southeast asia nay like for example chola have ruled over several parts of the present day indonesia and that is why in indonesian region today we find some of the temples of <coughs> hindu religion and why this this is what we call expansion of the hindu cultural influence outside india so in this way one example could be given then chola period is also famous for the wall paintings of the cholas and in these wall painting again we find there are both religious as well as secular painting religious painting are related to the paintings of the gods and goddesses and secular paintings are related to the paintings of the uh, of the of the human beings animals and other such thing so in this way both the gupta and the chola period is considered as one of the important landmark in the history of india for the indian heritage and indian culture these are few of the examples and these are the points on which this answer could have been easily written then the third portion from the culture portion and this is the image of that brihadeshwara temple which i was talking to you about this is the vimana of the temple it is said to be the tallest vimana of that time and now we come to the third portion discuss the significance of lion and bull figure in indian mythology art and architecture this was again a very easy question many times even today when we see the images of certain gods and goddesses in hindu religion we find that these gods and goddesses are accompanied with a lion uh, sorry uh, with an animal it can be a lion it can be a bull sometime it is peacock sometime it is mouse also like in the case of lord ganesha so here we have been asked about the lion and the bull now what is the significance of lion in the indian mythology so significance of the lion in the indian mythology is 
that in indian mythology lion symbolize royalty and protection and that is why not only with the gods and goddesses with some of the kings also we find that lion has been associated like for example you all might have heard about the king called tipu sultan he is called as the tiger of mysore so why because there the word tiger symbolize his strength his power now here in the case of lion lion is associated with the symbol of royalty and protection along with it lion also symbolizes wisdom he is the king of jungle so he symbolizes wisdom lion also symbolizes pride because of that strength that royalty that protection which he provides to others these values or these ideas are associated with him now how do we find it in indian art forms then one good example is the mauryan art you all may be knowing about the king ashoka and upon the pillars of ashoka we find there was a lion capital the same lion capital of the ashokan pillar was later adopted as the national emblem of india even today in that national emblem we can see the image of the lion which was there upon the ashokan pillar so during the mauryan period lion came to be associated with the idea of the glory and the power of the king and mauryan ruler ashoka was very much influenced by buddhism so that is also one of the reason that why in the capital of the ashokan pillars we find the image of lion then lion in terms of religion is associated with both buddhism and hinduism in case of buddhism lion is associated with bodhisattvas that is those deities which are worshiped by the mahayana buddhist so lion is associated with the power of the bodhisattva in case of hinduism lion is associated with the worship of narsimha lion is associated as the vahan of lord durga and there is also one more thing which you can write in the answer is that in buddhist uh, tradition lion is also a symbol of the birth of lord buddha so in that way we find the use of lion okay and then now we come to the use of the title singh now again you see here that the title singh is used by some martial communities in india one of that martial community is the rajput and another that martial community is the sikh both the rajput and the sikh have played very prominent role in the history of the india and even today with these communities the men of these communities use the title singh after their name because they want to reflect their idea of martialism and for that they are using the word singh and singh means lion then again we also find many images of lion in the neolithic cave paintings which belongs to the prehistoric ages of india some of the images of these neolithic painting are that of lion then we come to the another animal which is mentioned here and that is bull now everybody knows that shiv is mostly accompanied by his bull whom we call nandi and why because here the bull symbolizes fertility and strength so the bull in that way is one of the vahanas of the powerful god shiva and in many shiva temple if you go to visit those temple you can find these kinds of images this is the image of the bull nandi of shiva this is one image of the shiva's bull in front of the hindu temple revalsar himachal pradesh then this is another image of the bull which is from a temple in thanjavur this is another image of a bull which is from a temple in gangai konda cholapuram and just now as i mentioned with you this fact that indian culture has also been influencing the cultures of certain south and southeast asian country so there is one very popular temple in indonesia that is also a shiva temple 
and the reason here which can again be given is that chola rulers were mostly the worshippers of lord shiva so there is one image of nandi at parambanam which is a temple in java indonesia so there we find that these images are found so again you see na, that how bull has influenced the indian mythology art and architecture then in the contemporary times also you will see that in the art of making cinemas both in bollywood as well as in south india tollywood in both these arts in bollywood as well as in tollywood we find that whenever the hero's glory and power and strength has to be shown he is made to fight with lion and bull in one of the very popular film from south india bahubali we find this scene so here one of the lead character of that film is fighting with the bull why because they had to show about his strength about his power about his courage then in one of the bollywood films here we see the hero is fighting with a lion so in that way in both the cases lion as well as bull has been used to showcase the glory the power the strength of a person so that is how we find in indian mythology these two animals have been taken so these were the three question from the culture portion then we come to the next question the next question is from modern history why did the armies of british east india company mostly comprising of indian soldiers win consistently against the more numerous and better equipped armies of the then indian rulers now this question is about the causes for the establishment of the british rule in india or the causes for the success of the british in india no doubt the question is mostly indicating towards the military weakness of the indian rulers but when writing an answer we should take a bigger picture so that we can justify the statement which has been given to us in the question here we can begin with we can begin our answer with this thing political weakness of that time and this is what i many time tell in my classes also that we or our rulers of that time did not got defeated only because of their military weakness but also because of certain conditions of that time other than military and what is that condition the political condition of the 18th century in the 18th century british occupied india and that is the period when we find that the mughal empire has declined after the decline of the mughal empire there was the rise of regional kingdom kingdoms like avad bengal and others have come and among these kingdom we find that one major problem was the lack of unity these kings of different kingdom could not unite there was hostility among them there was bitterness among them they kept on fighting with each other so 18th century is that period when complex power struggle is going on among the indian powers for political supremacy in india now in that complex power struggle we see that british had an advantage how british could easily play their politics of divide and rule in this situation and here you can give some example one example you can give that how to defeat tipu sultan british broke the alliance between mysore maratha and the nizam this alliance was built by hyder ali tipu when he became the ruler and was fighting with the british british broke this alliance they won marathas and nizams to their side and with the help of them they defeated tipu and later they also fought a war with maratha they defeated marathas and then they made nizam sign a subsidiary alliance treaty with them so it is not about the military weakness only it is also about the political conditions of that time so this is one thing from which we can begin our answer then another thing which we can write here is the lack of understanding or a forest sightedness among the indian rulers the indian rulers of that time failed to understand the true intentions of the british and that is also why they were not able to stop them from conquering their own motherland and then finally we can come to the military factor we should end our answer with this because that is what has been highlighted in the question this is what is called recency effect so you can end your answer with that thing that yes military weaknesses are also there and what were the military weakness like what we find is there were many indians working as a soldier in the british army but the training given to these soldiers 
were like were in the european methods of warfare and when the training were given in the european method of warfare they were better than their counterparts in the armies of the indian king then another thing which we find here is that indian soldiers serving in the british army had superior arms and artillery because the british army was using that so they could also use it then the british indian troops were far more disciplined than their indian counterpart because european armies were made uh, were created as an army under one unified command and european army has to follow certain codes of discipline which were absent in the case of the indian armies at that time british indian troops fought under a unified command of the trained british officers and here you can again give an example like if you can give an example of the battle of baksar in the battle of baksar 1764 the number of the british army was very less as compared to the indian army at that time but what was the thing which made these two different is that in the case of the british army the whole army was one under one unified command but in the case of the indians at that time in the battle of baksar the army was from three kings of that period one was the mir qasim who was the deposed nawab of bengal another one was shuja ud daula who was the nawab of awadh and third was the shah alam ii who was a now who was the mughal emperor but who was not ready to sit on the throne because of the fear of his nobles so there are three different leaders and the army is in the command of these three leader but in the case of british there is one unified command and finally the british troop also had the facility of availing better transportation at that time especially in the 19th century when the british introduced railways and all in india they could easily transport their army with all the materials on that railways and that is the reason why that in spite of being less in number many time the british army performed better on the ground in front of the armies of the indian king so in that way this answer should have been written i have i have spoken to several students most of them have only focused upon this thing i wanted you i mean i believe that when you write these kind of answers you should give a more larger picture taking into consideration other factors of that time so that is how this question can be answered then the next question was again one very easy question the causes of famines in india now famine is a situation when we find a scarcity of the food for certain man made factors and people are dying because of no food so what are the reasons for famine in the british india one very important thing here is to keep in mind is that the main cause of the famines in the colonial india is the nature of the british rule this is the main cause of famine the british rule is colonial in nature and because the rule was colonial in nature the british ruler never paid attention towards the welfare of the indians they introduced those kind of system they introduced those kind of policies which distorted or destroyed much of the indigenous economy in india in case of famine we can mention about this thing commercialization of agriculture as a result of commercialization of agriculture which came to be witnessed in india especially from the 19th century onwards most of the crops which are being grown are the cash crops because these crops were to be used by the british industries for producing the goods so when large amount of the land in india came to be devoted for growing the cash crops there will be scarcity of the food crops in the coming times then another reason which we can write is the introduction of these land revenue settlements by the british rayatwadi permanent settlement and mahalwadi and we find or i hope all of you might be knowing that in all these three settlement the peasant class was very much exploited and peasant class was forced to give so much of money to the zamindars to the money lenders to the government that he was not left with anything at his hand with which he can fulfill his own basic need of the food and shelter and that is why at certain times when there was high inflation in the market right in the food grains we find that peasant was not in a capacity to buy that food and he is himself growing the land of somebody else or he is himself growing the crops which he cannot eat like the cash crop so in that way there was again scarcity of the food for the peasant class third reason which can be given is the insensitive approach of the government towards the peasantry the british government never took any care about the welfare of the peasant class in the case of permanent settlement area they left the whole peasantry into the hands of the zamindars who were very exploitative in the case of the rayatwari and mahalwari also we find that even though there the british are collecting taxes directly from the people 
or from the peasant but there was the, the approach of the british officials on the ground was very insensitive very insensitive and that is why peasantry was left with nothing to feed their own stomach and to feed the family members and most of them died because of the scarcities of the food and then finally one more point which we can write here is about the ruin of indian artisans because of deindustrialization and this is where we find that when the british goods started coming to india or the manufactured goods of britain started being exported to india then many indian artisans and handicraftsmen lost their employment they had their only source of livelihood is those uh, handicraft and art forms but they lost all that employment when they lost all that employment then they also had to suffer with poverty and the condition of the poverty among the artisan class resulted into various amount or many number of death because of the scarcities of the food so that is how we find sudden spurt in famine in the colonial india since the mid 18th century because of the british policies in india and because of the approach of the british as the rulers in india very nice and very easily this answer could be given finally the last question here is now from the chapter or from the topic post independence consolidation and reorganization out of all the questions of history i find this question to be little difficult because in the answer to this question you have to put many facts in your answers and whenever in the answers you have to write facts it becomes difficult for the student because inside the examination hall to recall all that fact is not always possible until unless you have consolidated your notes and the uh, books very well but still <clears throat> uh it answers to it can be written down because we keep on reading about this in the newspapers even today and the question was something like that the process which started in the mid 19th century is continuing na so some contemporary issues can also be taken into it and that is how you can easily write this answer there are certain historical aspect of it there are certain uh, aspect of the contemporary time also into it like this question is something which should be started from the period 1858 i think we should start writing answer from here and why 1858 because it is talking about the mid 19th century so mid 19th century means this period around 1850s and why i am saying 1858 because in the year 1858 the power of government in india was transferred from company to crown and now the crown will directly rule over india now when crown directly ruled over india then whatever territories of india was captured by that time by the english east india company that territory consisted of around 60% of the total land area of india around 60% and it is also said by certain statistics that 75% of the indian population lived in this 60% territory now this 60% territory is known in the history as british india rest 40% was that territory which was divided among the indian kings where they have established their own kingdom since long we call them the princely state now political and administrative reorganization of the state and territories begins from here and how does it begins from here that when the crown took the direct charge of the administration in india the british india was divided into provinces just like today you see the country has been divided into states in that time the country was divi being divided into provinces and that country that is british india territory that was divided into territory and from 1848 1858 this process has begun as a result of which by the beginning of the 20th century we find that british india consisted of eight major and five minor provinces these minor provinces are also sometimes called the chief commissioner provinces because the major provinces were administered by governors and the lieutenant governors now here you need to write some of the names of these major and minor provinces numbers you should remember we even if you do not remember all the names you can write few of them so this is how we find the things at the beginning of the 20th century the 
things have begun from the middle and then by the beginning of the 20th century this provincial reorganization has been done and as a result of it we find this then at the same time in the beginning of the 20th century we find there was partition of one of the british province in india that is bengal and why i am mentioning this in the answer because everybody study about this when we are studying modern history we study swadeshi movement and swadeshi movement is because of the partition of bengal that was the first mass movement from the congress play forum so that is what we can write partition of bengal and in the partition of bengal what did they do they partitioned bengal and created one new province in india that is east bengal and assam this province was created in 1905 when bengal was partitioned now after this province got created till 1911 it remained like that in 1911 the british took the decision to annul the partition and when the partition got annulled then what happened then the eastern bengal and the western part of bengal was again joined and that new province came to be called as bengal then the part of bihar and odisha which used to be the part of bengal province that was separated from bengal and a new province was created by the name bengal and odisha and later this province was also divided bengal and odisha which is one province it remained as one province till 1936 in 1936 odisha became the first indian state to be organized on the basis of the common language because what we find that a movement was going on inside odisha region that they should be separated from bihar in fact this movement started in 1890s itself when they were the part of bengal province and as a result of this movement when it reached to its peak in 1936 odisha was made a new province so that is how we write now that how it is a continuous process it is started from the middle of the 19th century by the beginning of the 20th century we find there was these kinds of provinces then at the same time bengal was partitioned it remained till 1911 then in 1911 partition was annulled and when the partition was annulled then this is what happened that is bihar and odisha became a separate province then assam became a separate province and then eastern part and western part of bengal was joined and it became one province then bihar and odisha remained that province the one province till 1936 in 1936 odisha was separated from bihar so in this way the things happened at that time then going by these th these ways in 1947 there were 17 provinces of british india in 1947 when india got independence now when india got independence then india was partitioned also that time then when india got partitioned then 11 provinces came to india three provinces went to pakistan and other three provinces were divided between india and pakistan this one piece of information we can again we don't need to write the name of all the provinces then now one problem which came that how to reorganize these provinces in the independent india and at the time of reorganization one more problem which was faced was that princely state were also joined with the union of india okay hundreds of princely states were there which were joined with the union of india now these many princely state with these provinces which were the part of british india were to be reorganized and at the time of that a problem which came is that should these provinces be organized on administrative or historical grounds or should they be organized on linguistic ground this is one problem which came in the beginning two i mean committees were appointed one which we call dhar commission 1948 and another which we call jvb committee in the year 1948 uh, these commissions and committees were appointed it is said that both this commission and committee rejected the idea of linguistic reorganization they rejected this and this rejected it. and when they rejected it there was much agitation in south india as a result of which coming under the force of the public opinion in 1953 the government has to create the first linguistic state andhra pradesh for the telugu speaking people in this region and then the government realized that they will have to listen to the demand of the people in december 1953 nehru appointed a commission under fazal ali and this commission submitted the report where it suggested that reorganization of the territories in india 
could be done on the ground of the language. The result was that it resulted into the creation of 14 states and six union territory. But this does not mean that the things have stopped there. After that, this reorganization has continued because every time we find that after a certain interval, a new demand from the side of the people living in one state has started arising. And then government has to listen to that demand. And here you can give two examples. In 1960, the state of Bombay was bifurcated. In 1963, the state of Nagaland was created for the sake of the Nagas in the northeastern area. And then we can come to the recent time. And here in the recent time, you can end your answer by giving these two examples. I mean, these two uh, references. May 1987, Goa became the 25th state of the Indian Union. And then uh, in 2000, three new states were formed, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Uttaranchal, and finally in 2014, Telangana became the 29th state of India. And while writing about these examples, you can also write about the reasons why these states have been formed. That is, to fulfill the local aspirations of the people. Now, in the case of Jharkhand, it was the local aspiration of the tribal-dominated region of Bihar. In case of Telangana, we see that the people of the Andhra, especially in the coastal areas, they were feeling deprived. They were feeling discontented because they were of the opinion that the development which has been witnessed in the area in capital of the city or the state and around it was not being passed to them. So they needed to be separated. So finally, we find Telangana was created. So in the same ways, at every time we find there are certain local aspirations. So this question is related to developments in the history of the modern India till 1947 and then till the present. And if you will see your syllabus, there also they have mentioned the things in this way only modern history from the middle of the 19th century until the present. And that is how you can answer all these questions very nicely. And as I said in the beginning, that inside the examination hall, a student sometimes fails to write the answer because when he sees the question, he finds that it is for the first time he is listening to that thing. And it may be true because for the first time that thing has been put in front of him in that manner. But don't be frightened because if you see in these questions, most of the things which are being written in the answer are those which you can find from any basic book of history. Any basic book of history. You can find these things. I, 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 I know that most of the students preparing for UPSC examination for history, they refer to the book of Spectrum by Rajiv Vahir, then R.S. Sharma, Satish Chandra. Even if these books you are referring to, I mean, from here you can find all these answers. And regarding the last question which I have discussed with you, we all keep on, we, we all know that the civil service aspirant studies the Hindu newspaper. So when you study the Hindu newspaper, you keep on getting these informations from there also. It is just about organizing the things in a calm and cool manner inside the examination hall. Don't get frightened by seeing the question. Just give little time to it to think that from where we can bring the answer. Answers will be there with you because those who are preparing well, they are going through these sources. Okay. So thank you all. Thank you very much. And that is what all I had to discuss today. Bye. Take care, everybody.